Thank you very much. Delighted to be here. This is a fascinating place for all of us to be as we contemplate the presidential election. Several of the presidents of the United States have spoken here and some presidential campaigns have begun here. As we look at the election, several factors are shaping this one. Which are the most important issues? What factors play into it? Who will the candidates be? What candidates other than Bill Clinton pose the greatest threat to Bill Clinton? And as we begin to sort all of these out, my son said only half the audience would get that. Uh, <laughs> that's because he's in Washington. Uh, we have a group of panelists here to help us sort out these and many other questions that all of you will have. Uh, and I would just like to remind you there will, as Bill indicated, be an opportunity for questions. Uh, as you're forming those questions, uh, I would ask you to please keep them uh, uh, very brief so that we can get to many of the questions. Uh, Charles McDowell is the Washington columnist for the Richmond Times-Dispatch. He joined the paper in 1949 and has covered all the major political conventions since 1952. Mr. McDowell, as I'm sure you know, is a frequent panelist on the PBS program Washington Week in Review and is the author of three books including Campaign Fever, a journal of the 1964 presidential campaign. In addition to his reporting duties, Mr. McDowell lent his voice to the Ken Burns documentary, The Civil War, as well as the one on baseball. Julie Johnson was named ABC News Justice Department correspondent in September of 1994. Prior to her television experience, Ms. Johnson reported for Time Magazine, where she covered Congress, the Justice Department, and the Supreme Court. And for the New York Times, she covered Congress and the White House. Ms. Johnson reported in the 1988 presidential campaign while at the New York Times. David Broder is a national political correspondent and columnist for the Washington Post. His syndicated column appears in more than 300 newspapers worldwide, including the Boston Globe. Mr. Broder is the author of several books, including the 1987 Behind the Front Page, a candid look at how the news is made. He won the Pulitzer Prize for Distinguished Commentary in 1973 and was a fellow in the Institute of Politics at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. To our panel. Thank you, Peter. Um, Washington Week in Review is, uh, is a changing uh, um, show in which some of us elders are getting to know all these young people. And the future of journalism is very bright and uh, very numerous. I hate to do this again, but I will uh, tell you my Washington Week story that gives me good luck for the rest of the night. I, uh, I'd been on Washington Week two or three years, and uh, some of the older members later confided in me I'd begun to get cocky and uh, act sort of strange. And uh, uh, then I got well, and I got well off one letter from a lady in, uh, I thought I was a celebrity, from a lady in Niagara, New York, who wrote for herself and signed it, her name, 77 years old, and her husband, who was 84, scrawled beside it. And it was a very simple letter, one uh, salutation, and three sentences that sort of have been my psychiatric therapy for my whole life. I've got it straight now. A dear Mr. McDonald, <laughs> if you're a great celebrity, that's sobering. Uh, sentence one, sometimes you don't seem to know exactly what the others are talking about on Washington Week in Review. <laughs> two, neither do we. <laughs> three, so having you there makes us feel better. An actual, real letter. Um, 
before I talk some about the current political situation, I, I, uh, I made a note that it was about a year ago that I read in an out-of-town paper, not in the Washington Post, that Newt Gingrich had referred to some members of the press as a socialist elite trying to run the country. And I said to some historian type that I thought really that was a pretty heavy thing to say, uh, that, that people didn't usually say things like that. He said, oh no, public figures. I said, Speaker of the House saying that? He said, sure, Herbert Hoover said at least that strong. And I never thought Herbert Hoover said anything about the press. I thought he was a nice, gentle, ineffective man. And uh, uh, it turned out that what my historian friend called me up and read me what Herbert Hoover said in 1930. He said that every president should be allowed to shoot two reporters a year. <laughs> without explanation. Um, uh, we're looking ahead to 1996, and I confess that 1992 and 94 interest me as much because they've been two of the most interesting years I've seen since I started trying to cover politics in 1952. Um, in 1992, after the amazing years of Ronald Reagan, eight-year period in which he did some stuff that was clearly messed up and ill-advised and some stuff that for all I know was brilliant, but whatever it was, it just kept being approved of. And uh, it just worked fine and the president was there and he was the president and he was succeeded by George Bush. George Bush went on as part of the Reagan-Bush era in Amer the American presidency to once a, a, a approval rate of 90% in a poll. That man who had the 90% approval in four years after Ronald Reagan's eight years uh, dived from 90% to 37% in the election, to Clinton's 43% and 19 for Ross Perot, the politician. Make a note that I was told about when I was very young. When third party candidates get over 10%, you're going through a kind of change in American politics that that third party vote warns you about. And uh, I think that turns out to be right. In any case, the Republicans lost the presidency in just 1992. That's not so far back. They lost the presidency after holding it for 20 of 24 years. The Democrats in taking over the White House, also took over the Congress. In the Senate, 56 to 44. In the House, 258 to 178. So it was a sweeping, vast victory that we've long put down as the time uh, somebody got 43% of the vote. But this was a takeover. All right, 1994. More awesome. I don't remember that anything vast happened in 1992 to 1994, and I will not make a cheap joke about, except Clinton uh, uh, was there kind of acting like I act sometime, trying to please everybody in the room. Uh, I, I think more was going on than that, but not a lot. 1994, the Republicans took the Senate and the House together for the first time in 40 years. Say that over and over, that's not a small matter. In 40 years. They had not done that. They lost not one incumbent. If you made a movie, I wrote a short story in which somebody won control of the House and Senate and lost not one incumbent, you would say, well, that's impossible. Don't say that. That's what they did. It was awesome. And then they came forward with Gingrich's contract with America that proposed the greatest changes in the mission of the federal government since Franklin Roosevelt and maybe much vaster than that. Now, the next step is 1996. I don't know what's going to happen in 1996. I'm not sure anyone knows what's going to happen in 1996. I'm not sure what's going to happen in 1996 is directly related to what's happening in the government of the United States. I think it might be related to psychology, to income, to the economy, to an indignation with politicians that that is almost beyond explanation. I don't know. I'm going to talk about it for a second, but Daniel Yankelovich, a pollster and analyst in a magazine that I don't pretend I read every 
month, uh, Mother Jones, says something that has a ring of truth to me. So are the rebuttals to it that the two people I've said it to have rebutted back. But for the sake of the argument, Daniel Yankelovich says, and I tend to go along with this, so I'm exposing myself. The Republicans, quote, have misread their electoral victory as a blanket endorsement of conservative Republican values and now find themselves entering the 1996 presidential campaign far to the right of the electorate giving Bill Clinton a real shot at re-election. I think that sounds roughly true. And apparently that's what polls tend to say if we think people are voting on the politics of the situation and not on other things. I am hung up on what has to be a fundamental factor in the strange political upheaval from 92 to 94 and on to 96 if you want to buy uh, Yankelovich. And that is an economic reality that is, to me, huge because I don't understand economics, but I know a fact when everyone tends to agree. This is a tremendous figure. Since the mid-1970s, 80s, 90s, that's correct. Since the mid-70s, four-fifths of American households have experienced a loss of purchasing power. Even with uh, uh, more women having taken jobs and gone to work, that household income has still been declining for 20 years in four-fifths of American households. Those not educated past high school have taken a 20% cut in income in terms of what it'll buy. 20% cut for people that are not educated past high school. Meanwhile, one-fifth of Americans have gained income at a rate almost unprecedented. Now we're talking big stuff for a whole chapter in the history book here, it seems to me. And uh, I, I don't hear that much about it. What has happened is we can feel the anxiety. You can feel anxiety from those militias to just out in the street. There's anxiety, there's anger about hard times. There's resentment of politicians. No one really knows what they're up to anymore anyway. There is a resentment against people on welfare from people who are having a hard time keeping their job and not getting laid off. And, 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 and there's a, some really unpleasant uh, uh, anger at people, the working poor who get tax credits checks in the mail. That makes some people who make a little more almost indignant. It sounds like the government is just taking care of everybody but them. Uh, and this agitation reaches out and touches crime and gun control and I think a, an increasing racism in America that's very much connected to welfare. A new element of people beginning to feel bitterly about uh, other people, including little babies who didn't have anything to do with getting born, uh, uh, and a contempt for politics and politicians that's pretty scary. Um, I have written the words radical conservatism of the contract with America. Uh, uh, I guess it's rad radical, some would call it radical. Uh, it does, we can talk sometime about the good it's done if, 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 if we see that it's rallied a lot of people good politically, but it has created some problems for, for the Republicans that I think we ought to watch. Elders are resolutely angry, a very large chunk of my fellow Medicare people. I'm on Medicare, and when I appeared on C-SPAN and said about four months ago, before the Republicans did anything, that I kind of agreed with John Kerry, a Democrat, and some Republicans that we had to find a little way to reduce the amount it was costing people because we couldn't possibly afford it. Uh, I got the meanest 116 letters I've ever gotten in my life. Many of them on the stationary of the, well two on the stationary of officers in banks. Indignant. We put that money in and we gonna get it back. Well we didn't put all that money in and, and if we get it back our children are gonna be so broke they'll be crawling around. Uh, 
at the same time that these older people are resolutely angry and they will not be deterred and they will cast votes against people who vote for the Republican. A lot of older people will, just know it. Uh, they are not that interested in the fact that this thing I describe as what had to be done is mocked and, uh, by the fact that the same, the same set of Republicans uh, uh, put a tax cut for the wealthy into the bill. So if you're going to cut the taxes to the wealthy and do that to the old folks, I sort of almost get back with the old folks, but uh, I can tell you they're angry. There's massive welfare cuts, especially stopping aid to innocent children, offend some middle voters that Gingrich uh, uh, doesn't take notice of yet. He may privately, but there are some people in the middle of the old style of politics who are offended by the loss of welfare as a federal entitlement in the United States in this era, though I think a lot of people agree there had to be some adjusting and some interest in doing something about uh, uh, jobs, connecting jobs to it. Um, the environmental, the reduction of the severity, and in many cases the distinct weakening of, of uh, regulations for clean air, clean water, and various environmental protective things are, will be felt because there are fairly conservative Republicans who are indignant about that. And if you take a house full of nature magazines that my kids left me with, you can read their letters and see that's true. Also, I like this quote because it's so straightforward. Russell Train headed the EPA for uh, uh, Nixon and Ford. And what he says about the Republican proposals are, are, are reflect what some Republicans think, and it's going to affect how they cast votes. The proposals will radically alter the environmental regulation put in place by a dozen prior Congresses and six presidents from both parties over the course of one quarter of a century. Unquote. It's a pretty good quote. Now the Christian coalition is a big problem uh, because I try not to say that I grew up with Pat Robertson in Lexington, Virginia. Uh, uh, we uh, uh, were in the first class together when I was five years old. Uh, and he was three and a half, and he was the smartest kid in the class. Uh, he remained the smartest kid in the class all through WNL. My father taught him law before he went on to the Yale Law School, where he finished very high in his class and on to the London School of Economics. So if you think this fairly dangerous force in American politics today is dumb, you don't get the fun of that. Uh, he ain't dumb. Uh, I disagree with him about nearly everything. Uh, I do not go back to the old days when he and I led fairly racy college lives out of the SAE house. I said, Pat, suppose I went and just walked back here where your elders are and told them about the poker you used to play and the, some of the stuff you used to do. I mean, good heavens, man. He says, Charlie, let's walk back there and talk to them now. I've been waiting for someone to tell them that stuff. And I said, wouldn't it embarrass you and them? He said, Charlie, you missed the point as always. I'm saved. You're not. <laughs> not a bad line. Pat's best line is, we go to the meetings. The fact that the Christian Coalition is in a very dominating position in 16 states or so, and maybe another 10. David keeps up with that sort of stuff. Uh, this is a they're taking a very conservative ideological positions on abortion, public education, and prayer, free speech, the rights of gays. All those things are tremendously controversial, especially with women voters. And I'm going to be over time here in two and a half more minutes. And if anyone wants to ask a question later about some remarkable gender differences in voting that I keep writing down when abortion is the issue, I would be glad to do it. Uh, I... Uh, uh, I think in any case, one of the most remarkable experiences at the end of the 20th century is to recognize the prominence and power of the Christian coalition in the old party of business in America. And it is history again being made. Irving Kristol is a very conservative Republican philosopher, and he says it this way, and I think he couldn't say it a whole lot better. Traditional Republican conservatives, economic conservatives, and the social conservatives of the religious right will now engage in a struggle for the mind and body of American conservatism. And that's what's going to happen, and we shall see. 
And I've now left myself one minute by my count to tell you a story about moral force in the world. 1976, New Hampshire. I am covering Morris Udall of Arizona, one of the funniest men that ever lived, certainly one of the funniest pro basketball players that ever ran for president, but a funny man in, in all cases. And we are, I am the only reporter with him this day, and we're approaching a congregational church near Hanover, and he and I sitting in the back talking sports, but a young woman in the front says, I've written you down four talking points, Congressman, and uh, they be, ought to be what you use at this church. And he said, keep them. I, I've spoken at this church. I spoke for Adley Stevenson at this church, and he named two other people. He knew the church in, in Hanover. And he said, I use as my text there the church's own motto. It's on the sign. And they said, well, what is the church's motto? And he said, well, wait till you get there. You'll see it. It's nice. So uh, we got there, and the kids ran ahead, and and uh, uh, when Mo and I walked on up there, they, they were laughing. They were laughing more, really, than what the motto led me to think, because I went and read the motto. And the motto was, if tired of sin, come in. And that was engraved, not engraved, but there were metal letters. If tired of sin, come in. And I said, Congressman, it's not that funny. Uh, I guess you can make a speech off of it. And he said, come on, Charlie, look down at the bottom. Up here, just above the minister and all, it did say, if tired of sin, come in. And down past the hymns written in lipstick across the bottom was, if not, call Marie, 308-2974. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to follow, follow Charlie, uh, as with any of my Washington Week uh, co-panelists, because they always have these stories to regale the crowd, stories that occurred before my birth. Um, <laughs> one evening I was on Washington Week, I don't know if Charlie was on that night, but Jack Nelson and me and uh, Rick Smith, for all of you who watched the program, and Steve Roberts, and all of them uh, sort of remembered Nixon's entry to China and they and Paul Duke was still the moderator at this time and they went on and on and on with these various events that occurred when I was in high school and finally I said well thank you Rick but I was in high school and they, they, they like to tell these stories uh, as far as the letters go uh, the transition for me from print to the network has made the letters only all the more humbling uh, most recently because I also appear on this week with David Brinkley on Sundays most recently, I got a letter from an elderly woman in California who said, you know, I'm uh, an elderly lady. I can't, hear, I can't hear anything you say on television, but I'm still glad to see you there. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it's, you know, Charlie gets them, I get them, we all get them. Um, the sort of strange political upheaval that Charlie was talking about and the public indignation with politicians and the resentments in the body politic are only likely to increase as this electorate gets grumpier and crankier in between now and 1996. That crankiness, though, will only be exacerbated if one issue, a very volatile issue, takes a hold in the 1996 election, and that is the role of race. The race card, some argued, after the O.J. Simpson uh, trial and in the midst of its summation, the race card was dealt from the bottom of the deck. The question arises now as we head toward the electoral season whether that card will be reshuffled, redealt, and in fact played during 1996, and the answer I would present to you is most definitely yes. The question, though, is yes, but how? And, and I think what we're going to see is something that's very subtle. The phenomenon that Charlie described has an intriguing analog when you start talking about voter discontent. I don't know if any of you saw this cartoon, but rather recently one of the uh, political cartoonists did what amounted to the no bozos, you know, the circle with the slash, with a number of elephants marching with these circles with slash over the names of Dole, Lugar, Lamar Alexander, every Republican candidate in the, uh, in the mix. And it's this sentiment, anybody but, and you could include in that uh, category anybody but Bill Clinton, that gives us the kind of public uh, discontent in which one man, who happens to be black, 
rises like cream to the top. And that person, obviously, is the one who's on everybody's lips right now, Colin Powell. It's out of that barrel of discontent, if you will, that Powell gets what we would just say shining adulation. Uh, he's had a five-week book tour in which he's gone from Barnes & Noble to Borders to Price Clubs and everywhere been crowned and uh, backslapped and had smiles and uh, the kind of adulation that only Bob Dole could hope he could ever find anywhere in the United States. I don't say that begrudgingly. I'm an undergraduate University of Kansas uh, alum and so I appreciate Bob Dole in the fullness of his crankiness and grumpiness. But um, <clears throat> having said that, the question for Colin Powell right now is whether this easy adulation that we've seen almost everywhere from here overseas will soon end and whether it will be supplanted by the kind of uh, beady-eyed, if not mean-spirited, scrutiny that presidential politics has really taken on in recent years. And in, in that scrutiny comes a lot of tough questions for him. Number one, it starts with questions and scrutiny about his family. Uh, starting with, we noticed this week, uh, the leak to Newsweek that his wife Alma has suffered from some form of clinical de depression over the years that has required medication. But Alma's focus will not be the only one with regard to his family. There will certainly be questions about cousin Bruce. Bruce Llewellyn, for those of you who are familiar with um, a millionaire first cousin Colin Powell has down in, to the south in New York City, will also clearly come in for some questioning. Whether or not he played an appropriate role in helping Mr. Powell even prior to him getting a $6 million book advance uh, from the publishing industry in New York City, helping him become somewhat financially independent, which clearly he was. In that role, uh, Colin Powell somehow as a working soldier uh, and government bureaucrat came up with a hundred thousand dollars to invest with cousin Bruce and Mr. T and OJ Simpson prior to his uh, legal difficulties in Los Angeles to invest in some uh, investment opportunities in Buffalo. Those kinds of things will be questions for Colin Powell that go far far beyond my American journey adulation. We're going to hear a lot about or we should should he decide to run uh, his charmed ascension through government. I say it's charmed because even though he, we know of him as a uh, military hero and we know a little bit about uh, his military background, I think by and large most people don't know the degree to which he was mentored uh, most at the earliest point by Nixon White House aides, Casper Weinberger and Frank Carlucci. Those gentlemen followed Colin Powell all the way through his career uh, making breaks for him ultimately in the Reagan White House. Both men again uh, reappeared for a second and third uh, visit to the trough in the Reagan White House and they too brought along a man who we've now come to know as General Powell. In addition to that scrutiny we'll ask where does he stand on the issues? The issues of abortion, the issues of affirmative action, the issues of school prayer. Now, a couple of weeks ago, maybe uh, two or three or four weeks ago, I was on uh, uh, the Brinkley program, and this issue came up, and I said this is prior to uh, the most recent petulance that's come from Gary Bauer, uh, who's president of a group called the American Renewal, and for those of you who haven't heard of that, perhaps you've heard of Focus on the Family and or the Family Research Council, which is Gary's other arm. He's a former Reagan White House domestic policy advisor who has come uh, to more recent claim to fame for reminding the Republican Party that let's, let's have enough of this flirtation with Colin Powell. But even there, I said that Colin Powell would face a considerable difficulty with the Christian right. And I don't think that that can be understated because in fact what we already know about Colin Powell's stands, while craftily articulated and sort of drawn right in the middle of the fence when he can, puts him at odds really with that wing of the Republican Party. Certainly on affirmative action, Powell has said that he believes the playing field is not yet level and that there is still some form of affirmative action needed. Now very recently he had one of his protégés, a former um, military official uh, from the Reagan administration named Rich Armitage. He was a Pentagon official during that uh, presidency. 
Uh, he has gotten word to Bill Clinton's Democratic Leadership Council saying, well, we sort of like what you're saying about affirmative action, which gets you closer toward let's revamp it or, or reshape it in some way, so as to put Powell on both sides of the equation. At some point, critical thinkers and people who are looking closely at his record are going to have to ask him, well, which one is it, playing field or revamping, playing field still not level or revamping. Similarly, on the contract with America, which is an issue upon which even if he eludes capture on the litmus test issues of school prayer and abortion, he shall not be able to elude capture on the question of where he stands on the contract. And as Bill Crystal put it, he really has to come close to Newt Gingrich's vision of the revolution. Now, if, if Colin Powell can reshape himself to embrace what Newt thinks, it will be almost as phenomenal as what Bob Dole has done to flip-flop away from everything Bob Dole once thought about the issues. On the contract with America, already Colin Powell has said it's too harsh. Now, he will have to somehow dog paddle his way back into some uh, position that is not quite so strident if he is to appease not only Newt, but all of Newt's soldiers who populate the Congress of the United States right now and have the strong majority there. Powell's burden, uh, certainly as he e evolves, whether he chooses to run really or not, will be one to answer, uh, uh, provide a solution for all of America's ills, particularly on questions of race. I was sort of surprised and dismayed, frankly, to see that he was asked to comment on the O.J. Simpson verdict. Uh, and then when he did comment on it uh, in some, again, fence-sitting, rather mushy way, he was criticized by Washington pundits uh, for not being strong enough uh, saying, in fact, that the outcome was somehow wrong or that there should be some reforms in the jury system. Um, it's a burden General Powell uh, will shoulder, ironically, in a way that is not shouldered by the other black man who's a Republican candidate for president, Ambassador Alan Keyes. Alan Keyes, uh, you may know, uh, garners less than 2% of support in the polls. Uh, he is a self-described invisible man, which is an interesting racially tinged metaphor even of itself. And uh, Ambassador Keyes is uh, the only black Roman Catholic and Harvard trained PhD whose appeal rests largely with the Pat Robertson type folks that Charlie was talking about earlier. Somehow Alan Keyes comes into the race uh, without a racial burden. That's one that Colin Powell will not be able to uh, to share with Mr. Keyes. In fact, when you listen to Jack Kemp or Bill Bennett or any of the Powell protagonists talk about him in recent days, it's always talking about him as some sort of healer, which is an interesting uh, notion because in fact polls show that Americans don't quite believe he's able to really do anything about healing the racial divide and, and the problems which separate us at this particular time. At least 41% think he might be good in that regard. 40% think he might not be. That's pretty evenly split, and it doesn't lead me to conclusively decide anything about him. One thing I would say, and it's worth contemplating for a minute, is whether or not Powell's standing, both in the polls and in the public consciousness, is somewhat overstated. Certainly, I feel it's overstated in his ability to bridge any racial divides. But beyond that, even though there's a hunger, I think, amongst many whites and blacks to see a resolution of some of these racial issues that popped up after the O.J. Simpson verdict and perhaps uh, reminded uh, all of us a little bit more to think about it after Louis Farrakhan gathered somewhere between 400 and a million and a half uh, black men on the mall, uh, is wh really where we're going on this question. If it's Colin Powell who comes forward as a candidate to help us uh, bridge these differences, a number of obstacles face him really before he gets out of the box, and especially since he has more recently than not indicated, hinted, winked, and sort of feigned as though he will run as a Republican. The, and the first obstacle I would uh, submit is the role that race has played in the Republican Party. It was in 1964 that Barry Goldwater first fashioned what has been come to known as a Southern strategy, 
Uh, he called it something a bit more simple, simply hunting where the ducks are. But it was a sort of top-down populism that exploited a lot of uh, discomfort amongst Southern whites and that was modified as the years went by by other Republican candidates over the years. Certainly Richard Nixon, enigmatic in many ways, uh, in this particular case, in his expansion of affirmative action as a legal principle and as a social policy principle, at the same time played, if you will, a race card by exploiting fears of the question of crime followed up by Ronald Reagan some years later in 1980 when he kicked off his campaign in Philadelphia, Mississippi using some would say code words, some would say not coded at all, uh, talking about states' rights. And then followed up George Bush uh, right here uh, with your bludgeoning your former governor with the Willie Horton episode. On the horizon for 1996, on this issue, again, although somewhat tangentially, but nevertheless present, is Patrick Buchanan. Pat Buchanan has been outspoken in saying a number of things. Number one, although he's unwilling to say whether or not he'd support Colin Powell, uh, anxious to point out that uh, Colin Powell does not seem to be the standard bearer of where the Republican Party is going, leaving aside his Reagan administration credentials. Pat Buchanan is certain to inject race into the um, 96 election in one of two other ways. Number one, in the wake of the O.J. Simpson verdict, uh, which is interesting, I, although I cover the Justice Department, I have only tangentially had to do O.J. duty, uh, but as a uh, legally trained person, uh, I don't call myself a lawyer, but I will uh, humbly admit to having a, a J.D. Um, the whole question that Pat Buchanan raises is whether or not the jury system should somehow be revamped, whether or not juries, particularly black juries, are able to come to conclusions that are appropriate in cases of murder, and if they are not, whether or not we should abandon the whole notion of unanimous jury verdicts or just go strictly to bench trials. Now, I would love to have a debate with him about that whole notion because when the Founding Fathers came over here remembering King George's England, that is precisely why we do not have star chambers and the like are precisely why we do not have simply bench trials or judge uh, orchestrated trials in this country. But nevertheless, Pat Buchanan will bring that issue up. He's also likely to play prominently on the question of the California Civil Rights Initiative, which will be important in 1996. It's likely to be on the ballot in California in 1996. That, too, will be a touchstone for questions of race. And probably all candidates, including Bill Clinton, who will have to hedge and fudge and uh, dance uh, perhaps most delicately on the question, will have to address what their positions are on CCRI uh, because they certainly know, all of them, uh, that they will need California to win or not win. The question of for Colin Powell at some point also becomes, should he play a second fiddle to Bob Dole? Clearly, you all are aware of the polls, as, as aware of them as I am, that Bob Dole uh, seems to win hands down with Colin Powell on the ticket. Uh, Colin Powell, in some surveys, beat Dole and Clinton on his own right. I think that those are hugely overstated, and I remember polls that said uh, Charlie's home state governor, Doug Wilder, was going to win by a landslide. Uh, some of those pre-election self-reporting polls turned out to be wrong, and at one of his elections he just barely squeaked in. I think that that would also be a phenomenon that Col Colin Powell would find some familiarity with were we to really see him go uh, into the race. Nevertheless, I think that Bob Dole's camp is thinking seriously about Colin Powell as a number two. Even with that, though, I would suggest that we might be somewhat skeptical about that. Dole and Powell have talked a number of times. Dole even talked in terms of crafting a strategy with former President Nixon prior to the president's death, and he was guided privately by Nixon in letters and in telephone conversations to run like hell toward the right before the convention. Once you get your nomination, somehow ease your way back to the center and forget about those people that got you uh, in the race. If that is in fact Bob Dole's strategy, which certainly he uh, seems to be following at this stage, that's problematic for a, an ultimate pick of Colin Powell, particularly before the uh, nominating convention. Even if 
Dole were to tap a Powell after his convention, one would have to ask, how do you reconcile all these, quote, moderate Rockefeller Republican views of Colin Powell with what Bob Dole said for the weeks and months leading up to his convention? Even there, the question ultimately would come down to one of mathematics, and that is, does the second person on a ticket really get the top name very much? The answer historically has been no. In this case, there is sort of a toss-up question about that, particularly if in a wild card, if you will, a uh, question of how many blacks Democrats would cross over to vote Republican were Colin Powell put on the ticket. Again, I would suggest to you that the numbers would not be all that great. The most recent opinion surveys amongst blacks and whites uh, who identify themselves as Democrats suggest that blacks still would overwhelmingly support Bill Clinton. Even if the numbers inched up to about 25 percent, it's not clear that that's a sufficient number to kick Bob Dole, Colin Powell over the top, in my view. And then, ironically, you'd have a Bill Clinton perhaps pushed right back into the White House for a second term. Colin Powell has said a number of things. I mean, I personally believe that he has mastered the art of selling books and selling himself to the press and doesn't really intend to run for president. Uh, the money is clearly there. It, many, many uh, political contributors have suggested to him, if you'll only run, we'll be there for you. It's this field of dreams strategy that if we build it, you'll show up. I hate those silly metaphors, being a native of Iowa. But uh, I think it also holds true with Colin Powell. We might ask Colin Powell, does he really have the fire in the belly to run, to overcome those obstacles I mentioned earlier? And even though he now describes his interest in running as somewhat of a pilot light, slightly burning, I'm just not quite sure that that's really, really enough. Surely voters, all of us, are tired of business as usual and would like to see some leadership. But for Colin Powell, <clears throat> I think the real question is, is the thirst for leadership and the thirst for something other than what we've seen in the political stage for the past dozen years or more really enough to answer affirmatively, yes, Colin Powell would be the next president? I would suggest to you that it is probably no. Thanks. Good evening. The uh, order of battle uh, clearly requires a uh, Washington Week in Review letter story. Uh, <laughs> mine was uh, a letter from a couple in uh, North Carolina who, uh, well, I wouldn't say that they were too critical of the thing. They just simply objected to my grammar and my diction and the content of everything that I said. <laughs> And this took about two pages, and then at the end, being obviously very nice people like all of the Washington Week uh, viewers, they thought and said, your tie and shirt and jacket matched very nicely. <laughs> <laughs> so I wrote them back, and I said, thank you for your suggestions, and next time I'll just send my clothes and stay home <laughs> myself. Uh, I need to explain something to you before I get into the substance of my remarks. You may have thought it rather odd a few moments ago that Charles McDowell from the Richmond Times-Dispatch was giving a report and analysis that sounded to me like it was something that Ted Kennedy had left on the podium when he had his famous debate here with Mitt Romney the last time I was in this hall. The reason that that happened is that the three of us were having some liquid refreshments over at the Bostonian before we came here to fortify ourselves for this question period that we've been warned is required of us. And in the course of the conversation, they, somebody suggested, wouldn't it be fun if we just sort of tried to give each other speeches? Julie had the good sense to say no. <laughs> she gave her own analysis. McDowell and I agreed to switch parts. So what you have heard in that liberal speech of his is actually the Washington Post view of things. <laughs> And what you're about to hear from me is the sound, conservative view of the Richmond Times-Dispatch. That said, let me uh, give you my 11 minutes of uh, pseudo-wisdom. Uh, it's based on uh, 
a project which I've just come off of. Uh, at my paper, uh, we have the interesting habit of going out and talking to voters ourselves from time to time. And uh, half a dozen of us are just back from voter interviewing projects where we literally, you know, walk precincts, knock on people's doors and say, I'm from the Washington Post, could I ask, take a few minutes of your time? We're out in North Carolina and New Jersey and Ohio and Texas and the state of Washington and even Charlie in around Charlottesville. Uh, we went to swing precincts, the kind of precincts that have been going back and forth in this pattern that Charlie described uh, so well. They were precincts that voted for George Bush in 1988 and then turned around and voted for Bill Clinton in 92, that supported a Democrat for the House of Representatives in 92, but then turned around and voted for the Republican in 1994. And I just thought I would give you a few general impressions. None of you are allowed to say any of this to anybody else because this is all going into our Sunday paper. So I get shot if it's uh, published in advance. Uh, contrary to what I had expected, uh, we found that uh, the voters were a little less surly, a little less angry than they had been uh, in 1994 or even a year in advance of the 1992 election when we did exactly the same kind of exercises. I guess the best summation of the thing came from a fellow that <clears throat> my colleague Dan Baltz was talking to uh, near Cleveland. He said, you could describe me as, quote, worst case satisfied. By which he meant, I think, that uh, he was not really ticked off, but he was just at the verge where if anything went wrong, he would flop back over and uh, think that things were pretty screwed up. Why the change? Uh, partly based on what people were telling us, partly on speculation. Um, I do think that uh, there's been enough economic growth in enough parts of the country, particularly these swing areas, which tend to be suburban middle income areas, not center city areas, uh, that folks are feeling a little bit more comfortable about where the economy is and where it may be going. One thing that's clear is that unlike 1991 when they thought George Bush was fixated on foreign policy, and unlike 1994 when they thought Washington was just hopelessly screwed up, uh, they now sort of have come to believe that at least the folks in Washington are working on the right problems. Not satisfied that the results are going to be what they like, but at least the distance between Washington's agenda and their concerns has been reduced a little bit. They are concerned about the budget deficit, about welfare, about domestic needs, and they see those things being fought over in Washington. Just incidental footnote, if Washington is diverted sometime in the near future into a big debate about Bosnia, whoever wins that debate, the public is going to be very angry because their reaction is going to be, hey, get back to what we want you to be working on. That's our problems here at home. Bosnia is Bosnia's uh, 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 problem. Uh, the Congress that was elected in 1994 gets very mixed reviews. It's seen as partisan. The lines are sharply drawn in voters' minds, uh, and the voters respond accordingly, depending on their own partisanship. But overall, by a fairly significant margin, they are saying that this Congress is an improvement over that Democratic Congress that was there with Clinton the first two years of his presidency. But they are concerned about what they're beginning only now to pick up about some of the substantive changes that are coming out of this Congress. We heard from a lot of people saying, let's take our time, let's make haste slowly, let's don't rush these things through, because we want to see exactly what you have in mind for doing. There is a concern, a real concern, and not confined, Charlie, just to us senior citizens, about the Medicare and Medicaid changes. 
But acknowledging that, my sense is that if at the end of this year there's a budget that has gone through and it looks as if it's putting the country on a path to eliminating these deficits, that is going to get this Congress a fair measure of approval, at least for a while, at least until the time that people begin to see the changes that have been made, these sweeping changes of which you spoke, filtering down to the state level and the local level and impacting, in many cases, on their own lives. Julie raised the question, you know, are people hungry enough for leadership that they might seriously consider somebody like Colin Powell? My own sense is that the answer to that at the moment is clearly yes. That sense that there is leadership lacking in the country is very, very strong. We did a national poll in conjunction with all of this door knocking, and the polling results, which again I can't give you in, in detail, would suggest that there are only a couple of people, maybe, who are seen as having above average or outstanding leadership qualities. Not talking about agreement with their program, just simply leadership qualities. Neither of them is the incumbent president of the United States, though one is closely related to him by marriage. <laughs> and neither is any of the figures now in the Republican field for president. But the other is obviously General Powell. The other people that we asked about all tend to be seen as somehow and to some degree lacking in those leadership uh, qualities. What is it that people say they're looking for? They want somebody first and foremost who will level with them, tell them what they really think and stick to it, whether the public loves it or not. They're looking for somebody who will rise above partisanship and they are looking for somebody who acts and talks as if he or she has real convictions, not simply postures that are adopted for political purposes. President Clinton gets mildly more approval now than he was getting when we last talked to these voters at the time of the 1994 election. He's seen as having kind of gotten his act together a little bit. But the reputation for flip-flopping stays with him very strongly, and there is a significant chunk of the voting population that simply despises Bill Clinton. They came to despise him in the course of the campaign, and what they have seen through their eyes in his presidency just convic convinces them even more that he is not fit to be leading this country. Senator Dole is clearly the Republican of choice in the current field, uh, with or without General Powell in the, in the race. I think at this point, Powell would be an underdog if he came in tonight to challenge Senator Dole. But the age question does come up spontaneously when you're talking to people. And there is a sense of harshness that's been a problem for Senator Dole, as we all know, going back to that 1976 vice presidential race of his. Uh, Speaker Gingrich's, the attitude toward him is considerably more negative than it is toward the Congress that he leads. Uh, one small symptom of that, but one that registered on us, four of us in four diff very different parts of the country heard voters use exactly the same word to describe Mr. Gingrich, loudmouth. That sense that he's got a lot to say and he says it with some real nasty edge to it has come through to people. When it comes to General Powell, uh, the reactions to him as an individual are Eisenhower-like, upright, honest, great American story, a real American hero. But as Julie suggested, I think very accurately, the game with Powell has played out almost as long as the public patience will allow. And people are saying, you know, he doesn't, we don't know anything about his views on anything. 
We don't know even whether he is really competent in politics. He's had a wonderful career in the military. But if he wants to be president, he ought to say, I want to be president. Then he ought to do and come talk to us the way the presidential candidates uh, talk to us. And presumably, that is what he's going to be doing if and when he makes a decision to run later this month. When it comes to the political parties and the possibility of a third party, the attitude is very interesting. It's kind of a tug between people's heads and their hearts. Republican Party has a big edge in our poll, and it comes through in the voter interviews. When you ask people, who better represents your views, Democrats or Republicans? But the Democrats have almost as big an edge when you change the wording of the question, and again it's confirmed by the conversations, which party cares most for people like you? My sense is that the public generally, and I'm really talking about these swing voters, kind of likes the approach that the Republicans are taking. They'd like to see a smaller government. They'd like to see less regulation. They'd like to see lower taxes. They'd like to see some of these powers and responsibilities shifted out of Washington back to the states and the local communities. But they're concerned that the people who are doing this, the Republicans are doing this, may not really be sensitive or caring people about those who may be hurt in the process of this change. And that's why they say, let's be a little cautious. That's why I think President Clinton has profited politically by identifying himself as somebody who is selectively going to be a roadblock to what the Republican Congress is doing. There is a lot of interest in a independent option or a third party. Uh, it's real. People aren't wedded to either the Democrats or the Republicans at this point at this point. Ross Perot, is, as an individual, is not a reassuring figure or a comfortable figure for people to contemplate as president. And to the extent that the abstract concept of a third party is linked directly in conversation or in polling to the name of Ross Perot, the support for that option really goes down very quickly. Perot has clearly succeeded now organizationally through his following, his organizational abilities, and his money in making that third party option real for the 1996 ballot. But he may be the Moses of this movement, somebody who can show you how to get to the promised land, but not the one that gives fated to lead people there himself. Final point. When it comes to the Democratic Party as a party, and particularly the congressional races, because we ought to remember that the initiative now in policy terms clearly has moved from the White House to Capitol Hill. The likelihood as of today, I think, is very great that the Republicans will retain their majorities in Capitol Hill, and then whoever is president will find himself, presumably a him, uh, dealing with a Congress that really has its bit in its teeth in terms of policy and program. And that may, in fact, may be more important, though we won't be focusing on it as journalists, than the outcome of the presidential race. Thank you very much.